The content herein is for informational purposes only, not intended as medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, and is not to be substituted for direct advice from your doctor. Today's LymphCast program is proudly sponsored by Vita Support MD, the makers of Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000. These MPFF-based nutraceuticals are backed by science and recommended by doctors specializing in venous and lymphatic disorders. Visit VitaSupportMD.com to learn more. Well, greetings and welcome to our LymphCast show, episode 49 today. We thank you for being with us. As a reminder, every single one of our shows is on YouTube. It's also on the podcast platform of your choice. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, Amazon, Audible. We are everywhere. Also visit our website early and often, lymphcastnetwork.com. Everything is there for you. Plus, if you have a question for the panel or somebody on the panel, you can email us at hello at lymphcastnetwork.com. Let's go ahead and meet the panel and get the show rolling here. One of our regular panelists from California, Dr. Emily Eicher. Hello, Dr. Eicher. How are you? Thank you, Paul. I'm great. And hello, everybody. And we welcome Dr. Kelly Storm. We are looking forward for your wonderful presentation and share your story about you. Yes, absolutely. And let's bring in the gentleman who started this whole show. He had the vision way back when. He's also the owner or founder of Vita Support MD. They make vein formula 1000 and lymphatic formula 1000 from New Jersey. Physician, surgeon, Dr. John A. Chuback. Hello, Dr. Chuback. How are you, sir? Hi, Paul. I'm doing fine. Thank you for being here and getting the show rolling here. I'm going to introduce uh, someone who's who's new to me personally. So forgive me if I leave a few blanks, which Kelly can can fill in. Today's guest is Kelly Sturm, and she's a physical therapist with her doctorate in physical therapy. And she's also a certified lymphedema therapist through LANA. And in terms of Kelly's education, I should point out that she went to Winona State University, where she got her bachelor's in science degree in movement science, but then went on later, after about a four or five year um, gap and it, having gained some experience, went to the Mayo Clinic, to the School of Health Sciences there to get her doctorate in physical therapy. But what I find so interesting about Kelly is that she's also an entrepreneur and she's the owner at Cancer Rehab uh, Physical Therapy, LLC, for the last six years, which is quite an accomplishment. And she has a great interest in cancer rehabilitation. And I think that that's where our overlap in lymphedema care and cancer therapy and post-cancer therapy and so on and so forth, what, what brought us all together. And I think we're going to have a beautiful conversation because as we all know, our, our very, very world-renowned and expert Monica, uh, excuse me, uh, Emily Eicher, who's with us tonight on the panel, is a, is a physiatrist, um, rehab, physical therapy and rehabilitation medicine doctor who has had her own battle with cancer, which she is continuing to win and her own history of lymphedema, which she is continuing to win. And so I think we're going to have beautiful, beautiful synergy here. So Kelly Sturm, welcome to the program and thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, that's correct. I've been a lymphedema and physical therapist for 11 years now, and I spent 10 years in a hospital setting working with not just uh, secondary lymphedema, but also primary lymphedema, cancer rehab, and then more recently I've transitioned into a private practice setting doing the same thing. Wonderful. And where is your practice now? Yep. I'm in the Twin Cities area in Minnesota. Oh, okay. M very little known fact. I spent my first semester of college at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. There you go. <laughs> because I wasn't nearly as strong as you. I came home with my tail between my legs because it was way too cold for Dr. Chubak. <laughs> I wasn't a doctor at that point, but I had never seen anything like it with wind chills below a uh, hundred below and the, the campus connected by, by uh, underground tunnels. Although tunnels. Other a beautiful, beautiful place. Do you know McAllister College? I do. Yep. 
Yep. That's not too far away. Probably about 15 minute drive. Uh, I know the Mayo Clinic too is also connected by tunnels. That's just, I guess that's how we do here. That's how it is, right? In Minneapolis by, by a bunch of skyways and things. And then Dr. Uh, Mark Moline, who's our very dear friend and colleague, you know, you know, Dr. Moline, don't you, Kelly? I do. Yeah. Dr. Moline was at Mayo now and did his surgical training at Mayo. He was at, um, he did his undergraduate at St. Olaf. Oh, sure. And, uh, so that's, that was another a great, great school in the area. Um, Emily, why don't you uh, get the ball rolling? Because you have so much in common, maybe uh, to open the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chubak. Kelly, tell us what got you interested in, first of all, physical therapy and then lymphedema. Yeah, absolutely. I don't have a specific time that I feel like physical therapy was the calling, but I knew I always wanted to be in the medical field. And after taking some time and shadowing different parts of the medical field, I just liked how physical therapy saw people routinely over a period of time. And you really got to spend time with the patients, get to know them and then see that progress. So that's what helped me with physical therapy. When I went to school at Mayo, I did not even know what lymphedema was. That was something that I had never heard of before. And it was in my schooling. We had a little bit of training on lymphedema, but I had a rotation, one of our clinical rotations at the Mayo Clinic within their breast cancer um, realm or their program. And at the time, it was a very small program that Mayo had. And I just really enjoyed it. And so within that program, I saw a lot of lymphedema, of course, at that time, cancer related. After I graduated, I had the opportunity to join an established cancer rehab and lymphedema program here in the Twin Cities and had some extra training. And again, from there, just fell in love with um, this population. And I think it's because it's underserved. And I know you all understand that very much. It's There's a lot of individuals in healthcare and also in the community that don't know what lymphedema is and don't understand that there's something we can do to help manage it or to help treat it. And I just really enjoyed um, playing a role um, to help these individuals. So that's really what got me interested. It was my schooling and it was an experience within my schooling uh, that really drew me to this. Congratulations. That you are very helpful to all the lymphedema patients. And you mentioned that you see also primary lymphedema. How frequent do you see primary lymphedema? Yeah, I, I would say it's probably about 15 to 20% of my practice day to day. Um, at this point, I have a lot of individuals who follow routinely, you know, once a year, every other year who come back. And so I would say that's... Uh, um, a smaller amount, but it, it I see it pretty frequently. That's wonderful. What is your most frequent population? Do you still see a lot of breast cancer patients? Yeah, I do see a lot of breast cancer patients when it comes to the cancer rehab world. That is the most common um, group I see. But I actually see lower extremity lymphedema uh, prime, the most. And I would say 70 to 80 percent of that is uh, from uh, secondary lymphedema from gynecological cancers is probably the primary so quite a bit of lower extremity um and and then i do see breast cancer too incredible uh, in the past way back when i started 30 years ago and i was trained by professor leduc and it was interesting. Initially, we saw a lot of lymphedema patients related to breast cancer. Now I see more gynecological and also prostate cancer, just like you pointed out. So compliments that you are there to help everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we see a lot of pelvic and genital lymphedema, a lot of head and neck lymphedema too, just within our area. And so we, we really do see a lot of it. I, I don't typically see pediatric, although I've seen a couple. We have a, a specialist in our area who is a pediatric lymphedema therapist. So within our area, we do have a lot of access, which is really, really nice. I know that's not the same everywhere. Right. And how frequently do you see lymphocentigraphy and uh, correlate that with the clinical presentation? Yeah. When... I had trained and worked with Dr. Nancy Hutchison, who is now a retired physiatrist, and she 
Um, that was a lot of what she did was getting lymphocentigraphy tests and, and um, whatever we had access to at the time. And so we, I've seen a, quite a bit of individuals who have gone through that. And what's interesting, I think, for other lymphedema therapists to understand is, you know, when someone has a test, we will see individuals whose tests look great, um, but their presentation or their risk is really high. And so we'll make sure that we're monitoring them. And then we've had individuals who have um, a, a lymphocentigraphy that would suggest that you're going to have a lot of concerns or issues with lymphedema and, and don't present that way physically. And that's why I think it's really nice when someone has access to, with that support of those tests, um, to really get an idea of um, what someone's presentation is, because it doesn't always match up with what they physically look like when they walk through the door. I totally agree with you. Um, in my practice, I do ultrasound on every consultation. And it's interesting to see that not always the clinical presentation correlates with what we see in subcutaneous tissue. Just recently I had um, a patient who was a lipidema patient. And when I did the ultrasound, there was a clear cut lymphedema in distal low extremity and quite significant lymphedema. And so it is so important to correlate the clinical presentation with some objective studies so you can then uh, properly address the patients and treat them accordingly. Yeah, absolutely. I think the lymphedema world, at least in the conservative therapy piece, it's the goal is really to continue to work towards individualizing care as, as you know, those tests, you know, really help look at someone's risk and what we're trying to watch for or monitor with their symptoms. Um, but it's also going that, that way. I, you know, um, Dr. Lise Kohlmeyer and their in group, the alert group in Australia are doing a lot with lymphatic drainage and watching that under ICG and then trying to individualize the direction and the patterns for each person on, on how to work. And so I'm really excited and hopeful for this community and the ways that some of this research is going to try to really help um, get the best care for each person. Fantastic. You just mentioned ICG. Dr. John, I have to point out, I gave an information for Dr. John uh, Jean Paul Belgrado to come on lymph, our, our lymph cast. So I think we should invite him as well because he's like the pioneer in ICG. Sounds beautiful. It would be our privilege to have him. Right. And that's a complimentary that you correlate with ICG. Well, actually, the, this is the Australian group. The ICG started not that long ago, maybe a decade ago. And with that, we can visualize everything about the lymphatic system, how the lymph system is moving and where the blockage is. And if needed, then the surgical intervention should then follow. And as you know, we do the lymph to vein anastomosis now quite frequently and lymph node transfer if that does not work. Yeah, and I think that's wonderful. We've seen quite a bit um, over the last probably close to a decade in our area um, from various surgeons and we're seeing more and more positive results and um, some really wonderful patients who have been out you know, five to 10 years from their surgery, really weaning down from a therapy perspective on how much support they need, how much garment compression they need, um, and just making it a little bit easier for the patients and how they self-care. Kelly, this is an interesting discussion. You know, not long ago, we had a very, very striking interview I found quite um, fantastic uh, with Dr. Hakan Brorsen from Sweden, who is a colleague of uh, Dr. Eicher, and they've known each other for many years. And Dr. Brorsen, Brorsen showed some dramatic before and after photographs of people that he's treated with, um, with liposuction using a specialized technique that he's developed and specialized cannulas and so forth um, with really dramatic results and long-term results. And Dr. Brorsen, um, of course, everyone has an opinion, and um, we certainly respect his opinion as a leader in the field, but he was less enthusiastic about lymph node transfer and lymph lymphovenous anastomosis. And so I wonder in your experience in, in Minnesota and having been at the Mayo Clinic and in a major metropolitan area in the, in the Minneapolis Twin Cities area, what has your experience been um, 
because it seems you say you feel that they've been getting better over time, lymph node transfer, lymphovenous anastomosis, and if you have any experience having seen surgical, post-surgical results in people doing liposuction for lymphedema. Yeah, that's great because I will be honest, I, I see a, a variety of responses and I've seen probably eight different surgeons, uh, patients from diff eight different surgeons. And so we know that everyone's techniques are a little bit different right now. There's not a uh, consistency across the board um, heavily at this point. I would say the the best results that I have seen as far as from a therapy perspective who individuals come to me for the post care and I follow them um, ongoing is the individuals who end up having uh, the liposuction first followed by an LVA, uh, possibly the transfer. I don't see a whole lot of those. Um, I see a lot more positive results with that first versus someone who goes directly into an LVA. Now there varies. Yes, there's some great results on both ends of that, but the consistency I see with the, that step or that order, um, I do see positive results for individuals reducing and staying reduced and not seeming to have to go back into as strong as garments long term. So again, if I understood you correctly, liposuction first, followed by LVA second, Correct. and you're seeing less uh, lymph node transfer procedures. That's correct. I can step in. I can tell you, I have seen so many different patients from so many different surgeons. And my own experience, I, I can tell you, first of all, every patient has to be treated on an individual basis. You cannot just say that this is what should be done for every single patient with low extremity lymphedema or even upper extremity lymphedema. If the um, ICG will point out that you have significant blockage or your lymph vessels are so inadequate that you cannot be a, a candidate for the lymph to vein anastomosis, there is no point of trying. And I've seen few patients. One was a primary lymphedema patient in upper extremity, and she had two four bridges done and two were successful and two were not. So she still has lymphedema, but not to the same degree. And my own experience, I had lymph to vein anastomosis in my right lower extremity, mainly because I had excruciating pain when I was standing for a longer period of time. And at the end of the day, when I had to be in the kitchen and cooking and I just couldn't bear the pain, and we are blessed to have Dr. Keaton Patel in Los Angeles. And so he did um, the ICG and with his procedure, and I think he connected four bridges, lymph to vein anastomosis in my right lower extremity, the pain disappeared within a day, post-surgically. And for me, that was the most, that was the prime concern. I still have lymphedema and I wear 30 to 40 compression stocking and uh, I would not encourage anybody to do more than that because it hurts below, behind the knee and we can have totally different discussion about compression and what kind of a compression and a proper fitting. But the pain reduction with the lymph to vein anastomosis was the most significant improvement in my experience and in most of my patients that I see after the lymph to vein anastomosis. And then I have one patient who was a primer lymphedema, low extremity, and a doctor tried to do the bridging and it just, there was not enough viability with lymph channels to connect them to the vein. Therefore, there was not a successful surgery, although the, per the, the physician is extremely talented and very knowledgeable. But if you have nothing to work with, you cannot have good outcome. So uh, overall, again, everything should be treated on an individual basis. And in this particular patient, uh, liposuction would not be of any value if you don't have a viable lymph system to, to work with. Overall, I would say about 90% patients that I see 
after lymph to vein anastomosis have successful outcome. But then we also have patient, one particular patient that comes to my mind, she is primary lymphedema and lipedema patient. So this primary lymphedema patient had lymph node transfer because the lymph to vein anastomosis was not optimal. And, and then she had a liposuction and she's doing very well. So it's very hard to say which approach should be the first approach and so on. But again, on every every surgeon has a different technique. Every surgeon has a um, different approach. But if you have a good lymphatic system to work with, lymph to vein anastomosis is going to be successful. But at the same time, you cannot go to, to this type of surgery with the idea that my lymphedema will be cured. It will be improved. And frequently I have patients like with questions, so when are you fix? When are you going to fix my leg? We don't do that, you know. I can say I can only improve, but not to fix to the matching, uncontrolled uh, uh, another side of your lower extremity. So again, back to everything. It depends what we have to work with, and most of the surgeons are very well qualified and very well trained in lymph to vein anastomosis and or lymph node transfer. And if you have a good lymphatic system, it will work. Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000 from Vita Support MD are backed by science and sold in doctor's offices. If you're a physician who may be interested in prescribing or selling these excellent nutraceuticals, please call 862-246-7877 to speak to a representative today. We're going to have to have Dr. Patel as a guest on the show sometime, Emily. I call him. I call him. He's so busy that he suggested, just like Dr. Granzo, that he's going to be maybe considering next year. Okay, very good. Go ahead, uh, he, he, he should make some time for educating the public, too, outside of the operating room so that people can can glean his, his brilliance and his knowledge. So we're going to keep on top of Dr. Granzo and Dr. Patel to, to be our guests for, for sure. Um, now, going back to our very wonderful guest, Kelly. So Kelly, talk to us. Now, we've talked a lot about surgery, and obviously you're not a surgeon, but talk to us about what you're doing and where you're paving new paths and making a difference in people's lives and your thoughts about um, aftercare for surgery or patients who are not candidates for surgery, et cetera. Let's say, for example, if you had your top five um, points of suggestion or recommendations for people with lymphedema, what would you say that those are? Yeah, that's a good question. So I guess for those who don't know, I started a YouTube channel and online platform in about 2019, just giving out some of this education because I was naive to think that uh, the understanding of lymphedema was, or someone had access to lymphedema therapy all over, and that's not true. And so that's where a lot of my direction has been the last five years is just trying to find ways to educate the community and things that um, we can do to help them. So as a lymphedema therapist over, well, again, the last decade plus, I think the one of the biggest things that I've learned, and we've talked a little bit about this, is that everyone has their unique needs. And so we talk about CDT, complete de decongestive therapy, and how important all of that is. And it, it is very important. But when it comes to all of the components of the therapy portion, and on top of that, all of the extra tools in the toolbox for someone to use, uh, it's not realistic for everyone to do everything. And what we do... Our therapist, our goal or my goal is really to find what works for each person. So in my experience, when it comes to conservative treatment or, or management, compression really is the best, but it comes down to finding the best compression for each person. And that's going to look different for each person, depending on um, where they're at, what stage lymphedema they have, what kind of how their skin integrity is and how they manage it. So spending time, which isn't always easy, but working through and finding the best compression Compression is one of the best things that I think someone can do conservatively to manage. I think it's 
on top of that, we talk about lymphatic drainage and I will be a lymphedema therapist that says lymphatic drainage isn't great for everyone. And why is that? It's, it's great as a component, but when it comes to self cares and carry over day to day for each person, it takes time. It's hard to reach for some people if they're trying to reach their lower leg. Um, I prefer if they don't have time to do lymphatic drainage that they would just try to go exercise. because so we know how important exercise is for lymphatic drainage and also for the body. So it's just really finding what works for each person and each individual. And I think that, that there's nothing more important than that when it comes to um, lymphedema therapy. I think another thing that I would encourage would be to not forget about fibrosis or changes in tissue. Um, as lymphedema therapists, we were taught, you know, a decade ago to be really gentle, really light, but that's very superficial on the tissue and we're not getting into the areas that are more fibrotic and not supporting them. And so I think they're the schools, the lymphedema schools are changing and, and moving into that direction, um, which is great to see. And I hope that we continue to see that and, and support other um, therapists in their training. Let me, let me, uh, Pause you right there and hold your thought on your list that we're going through because I find it very valuable and fascinating. Now, Emily, this is an incredible point that uh, Kelly has has raised, and I have always, as a surgeon, and early on with my introduction into hands-on lymphatic therapy, manual lymphatic drainage, etc., was always. Uh, somewhat astonished by this concept of the very, very light touch and so forth. You've been doing this for several decades now. What is your feeling on the depth of manual lymph lymphatic drainage and the history of that, how it's changing, where the truth lies, and probably perhaps it's a patient-by-patient -patient basis again? Definitely it's patient-by-patient, -patient, but having the luxury of having a lymphedema in my leg I experienced just about everything uh, when it comes to lymphatic insufficiency. And just like you mentioned compression stockings, I can tell you, and if I would have a one room filled with all the compression stockings that I tried on, uh, on my leg to which one fits the best, I would have not enough room. But uh, again, everybody is different. And when you look at the lymphedema, the, the compression stocking of certain companies, the ankle part is narrow and it flares up into the foot. Therefore, you end up with more swelling in the foot. But going back to the manual lymph drainage, way back when, when I had tried to hire some therapist, she was so darling. She tried to barely touch my skin. And I thought I told her, you are just wasting my time. It's it, you know, A patient has to undress. B, you have to show the efficacy. And I did show the efficacy. And perhaps maybe for the next show, we can show this with ultrasound. How much uh, subcutaneous tissue improvement and reduction you have when you do manual lymph drainage versus uh, compression pump treatment. And with manual lymph drainage, if you get 10% reduction, well, congratulations. Well, yes, indeed, you are moving all the toxins and so on, but also you are looking at efficacy. So very light massage is not going to be much very helpful. Now, when it comes to fibrotic tissue consistency, and as, as um, uh, Kelly can point out, most of the lipidema, lymphedema patients in distal lower extremities at the medial aspect of the ankle, the tissue consistency is firmer, indicating A, either starting fibrosis or the fibrosis are already there. Very light massage is just going to waste time of the patient. It's not going to show any efficacy, any reduction, any pain reduction, any uh, subcutaneous tissue reduction, and nothing for fibrotic tissue. Emily, so, let me interrupt again right there, because you, you two, you guys, you're so fantastic and so knowledgeable, both of you. you. You raised so many great questions in my mind. Emily has also, as I said, been around for a very, very long time in this field with tremendous expertise internationally. One of the things that I would like to ask both of you about your opinion um, 
that you touched on both is the complexities and challenges of compression garments. Emily, you've seen this over the years, and I know there are many things to include to consider, price being a huge one of them and practicality. But what role do you think bespoke garments, custom garments, fitted garments that we used to see back in the days when I was a resident, much more commonly, I, I feel, as compared to off the shelf standard fitting garments. Do you think that there's any any value in the in the custom fit, custom made bespoke garments or not really or yes? I'd like to get both of your opinions. I'll let you start, Kelly, because I have I can spend an hour on this one. <laughs> You start, Kelly, because you're a, you're a special guest. Go ahead. I'll start. Yeah. So in my opinion, we were talking about, is there a difference or help with the custom versus the off the shelf? In my experience, I would say yes. And, and the reason I say yes is because typically custom garments are more flat knit and the off the shelf tend to be more circular knit. So when I have someone with lymphedema and really when we're getting to stage two, stage three, definitely the circular knit garments, they tend to cause more tourniqueting, which you know adds to skin issues and more flare ups. Um, they're not as comfortable and people tend to swell through them. Whereas I see the flat knit garments that fit well, um, they do contain better. Yes, they're harder to get on and there may not be as comfortable for some, but as far as containment goes and managing goes, I do see more um, support with the custom flat knit garments. Beautiful. I'm going to stop you right there. And Emily, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to respond because we have so many good subjects to go through. She's like an encyclopedia, this woman. So I have to <laughs> I have to give her a 30 second clips. Go, go. After two buckets, yes, uh, yeah, yes or no <laughs> question. Uh, I flat knit. I tried flat knit. Flat knit has a value when you have someone who has disproportional lower extremity shape, if someone has much larger volume proximally and less distally, then you can fit them into custom made. However, as you know, with the treatment, lymphedema improves and it improves even to the point that you can have one size smaller. And so if you are going to send measurements to Germany, or, or I, I think we have now finally in the United States a uh, manufacturing company for flat knit uh, compression custom made, uh, then it's okay if it's done in timely fashion and it, you don't allow the patient to change the shape of the leg. Because if you are going to measure today and the patient gets the flat knit stocking a month later and the size is smaller, it's going to be rolling down and it is going to be uh, creating a crease in popliteal area and even uh, contributing to abrasion. And believe me, I've seen those two. The same thing with the opposite. If, you, if the patient expands and you are going to fit the patient into flat knit, then it's going to be pretty uh, detrimental. And I just had a patient last week nice old man after prostatectomy and he was fit into two flat knit thigh length uh, garments custom made and that ended up in the mid of his thigh not only it uh, migrated distally but it was so tight that induced genital lymphedema and no so has to be very careful when you order flat knit and when, and then you have to follow and evaluate the patient. Not only here are the startings and goodbye. You have to see how it fits. Is the patient able to put the flat knit on? And I tried flat knit and it did not work with me. Not because okay. I I'm calling time out. Your 30 seconds is up plus three minutes. But that's okay. She's ingenious this woman. Now, I want to go back to Kelly. Kelly, let's go with your your list of five top, if you keep track of where you were. I think we're on number three now, correct? Yeah, I like I said, compression's a big one. Fibrosis is a second one. Um, that lymphatic drainage is not for everyone, um, would be the third. Um, and then another one that um, 
I would, I would go with, we go back to the surgery discussion a little bit is that for individuals, you know, surgery is becoming more and more available. There are more surgeons, um, more opportunities. So I know it's still growing and there's still work to be done there. But when it comes to conservative therapy, it's important. I think that for therapists and also for patients to know that there may be a time for some individuals if the progression is continuing and conservative therapy is not working, we need to know or at least have a discussion on when it's time um, to discuss surgical options. Excellent. What are, as a physical therapist, what are your thoughts um, about techniques like dry brushing, sort of myth or truth, fact or fiction? <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of things like dry brushing, vibration, um, the list goes on and on. And I will, there are it's, it's very hard to keep up with, and there's not research to support many of these. But I also operate under the fact that I know that I don't know everything. I know that lymphedema therapists don't know anything. We have a lot to learn about lymphedema and lymphedema management. And so safety always comes first. Is it safe for the person? Is it not? Is there risk for infection? Is there not? These are things that need to be covered first. But if someone finds something that works really well for them, that they enjoy doing, that they can be consistent with it and they see benefit, um, I'm not going to say no. Um, again, if it's long as it's safe and it's something they enjoy doing or, or feel good about, um, I think there's a big piece um, to a patient feeling like they are um, managing for themselves well, um, because it's really challenging to deal with everything that they have to deal with. Agreed. I, I agree with so many of those statements that you just said. We always prefer when we have good evidence-based, data-driven uh, medicine, techniques, interventions, et cetera, but um, I also say again and again in this program that each patient is an individual and has their own experience. And there's also a psychosocial and emotional part. And the idea of self-care and so forth is very, very valuable, far beyond the placebo effect. Emily, some thoughts on uh, dry brushing and those kinds of techniques? Uh, Kelly, you said it well. Whatever works for a patient. And again, I tried dry brushing. It's not for me. And give me another 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, what works for me, and perhaps maybe I should join you, Kelly, for uh, a, a, some sort of a video, how to apply the stockings on and how to take them off. Because I wear the thigh length, I use the gardening gloves, which helps me the best. And... When I take my stocking off at the end of the day, sometimes I massage with those rough gardening gloves. And in the, they are, in a sense, rough, but they are not going to hurt my skin. I would not recommend dry brushing to anyone who has very thin skin, who has any open wounds, any scabs, anything like that. And dry brushing uh, may be good for younger population, better than older population with thin skin and not so much for lipedema patient and lymphedema, but skin care is so important for lymphedema and lipedema patients. But again, dry brushing may not be for everybody. We had one um, uh, wonderful lecturer who told us that dry brushing for her was the best. It may be the best for her, but it may not be for other population. So whatever you pointed out, whatever works the best for you, utilize it. But compression is an essential part of the lymphedema. You have to stick to compression, especially lower extremity patient, um, more than upper extremity patient. You have to wear whatever works, what doesn't give you a problem, doesn't give you any crease doesn't give you uh, any folds, especially in, in the behind the knee, in popliteal area, and something that you are comfortable with the entire day. And uh, so dry brushing may not be for everybody, but it is, it is beneficial. And perhaps we can do study with ultrasound where we can do maybe 15 minute dry brushing and see the subcutaneous changes in, in lymphedema tissue, is there any any change with the dry brushing or is it just physiological, uh, psychological? Kelly, let me ask you this. Do you have any, thank you, thank you, so, so, so well said. Kelly, do you have any 
specific advice or or uh, beliefs, evidence driven about uh, nutritional uh, recommendations for your patients with lymphedema? Yeah, that's a good question. As a lymphedema therapist or excuse me, physical therapist, I don't have a strong background in um, dietary or nutrition, but when I've done research and had conversations, um, the big thing for me, I know people have talked about the ketogenic diet versus another. I think it's very similar in the concept that someone's got to find what works for them. I mean, we talk about an anti-inflammatory diet and that would be beneficial. It it sounds like it would be, of course it would. But if someone can't be consistent with an anti-inflammatory diet because they don't like those kind of foods, it's not going to be helpful. Maybe it's a different kind of diet that they can stick to. I think it's about finding a generally healthy diet and whatever that might be, again, most important, finding someone that someone can be consistent with. And- I know Dr. Eicher has a lot of experience there and wrote a book with Dr. Herbst many, many years ago that remains sort of a uh, mainstay of of uh, thought leadership in that area. But moving on to another subject that, again, I'd like to get uh, feedback from both of you. Uh, Kelly, what about, um, what about um, creams? topicals, things like that for your patients with lymphedema. Any specific advice that our listeners might benefit from based on your experience there? When it comes to creams or topicals, I'm I'm in the area that I'm just looking at healthy skin. And when they're wearing compression garments, I want something that's not overly sticky, that's not going to try to break down um, the garments, that's not going to have a lot of perfumes and alcohols to irritate the skin. Those are the things that I look at when it comes to creams and lotions. At Vita Support MD, we believe in creating the best bioflavonoid-based supplements to support your vitality. Bioflavonoids are found in abundance in nature and support excellent health and wellness. The demands and stresses being put on our bodies in these challenging times are unlike any we have seen before. Support your body with the flavonoids it needs to fight inflammation and oxidation. Unlike other products in the marketplace, Vita Support MD dietary supplements use micronized flavonoids for optimal absorption and effectiveness. Micronization is an advanced process which creates an ultra-fine powder easily absorbed by the body. At Vita Support MD, we are passionate about making your good health our life's work. I know that Dr. Eicher has sort of a, a secret secret sauce that she uses. Maybe she's going to be willing to share it with our listeners today. It's it's not something you might think of right off of the bat, but after many years of trial and error, what did you arrive at, Dr. Eicher, for your hands-on therapy in the office? First of all, as you pointed out excellently, um, the skin care is so very important and it has to be a healthy skin. And what helps me the most is castor oil, just one drop on my my hand, which is very viscous, and it helps me with the traction. And I do do the manual lymph drainage sometimes on patients. So with that, I feel the efficacy of the treatment with manual lymph drainage is far better than as opposed to not using anything. And I was I have the certificate in uh, manual lymph drainage. Uh, diploma from Professor LeDuc, and he never used anything. But that was, you know what, I think 30-something years ago. So with my practice, I found out that works the best. And not to use any oil, just to be gliding, but one little drop of the castor oil helps me the most. And only only on the skin that, that is fully intact, without any cuts, open wounds, and any abrasions. I'll have to try that one. Yeah, I told you that that's a well a well guarded secret, but now it's out. <laughs> and and we we even have the dosage. One drop applied to her hands. Emily, what happens if you use two drops? Not the same. <laughs> it's too much oil. And, and no, no. You- because of the viscosity. Our castor oil is so viscous, huh? Right. 
And I also use uh, compression pumps. And uh, you have to be careful how to apply any kind of excessive lotion and then utilize the compression pumps. And in into compression pump, I use a special sleeve, which I designed way back when. Uh, I call it the DM sleeve, and that helps me with the redistribution of the flow much better. And again, the efficacy of the treatment is far superior. Yeah, and it's very interesting. If anybody's wondering, because we don't talk much about castor oil anymore, it's kind of an older thing, but castor oil is a, is a natural oil that comes from pressed castor beans, believe it or not. Uh, so it's a, it's a vegetable, it's a pressed vegetable oil. Um, and how about, do either of you have any, because I know this, this is a very hot subject and one that I think Dr. Eicher also has some particular interest in, do either of you have any um, particular personal experience with the use of any topicals, uh, creams, lotions, et cetera, that include uh, CBD? I do not personally. I do. Go, Emily. Tell us. 30 seconds. It reduces the pain. It reduces the inflammation. Yeah, it's very interesting. I know, Emily, the reason I brought it up is because Dr. Eicher, who is my you know great mentor and guru in this area, mentioned that uh, to me, and it made it made perfect, really perfect sense. And um, for for those people, I think who are in a pro-inflammatory sp- state, especially those with with pain, but you do find that it has a topical anesthetic effect. Is that right? Absolutely. And a lot of patients post radiation burns utilize the CBD cream rather accessibly. And it helps them to reduce the pain uh, in a timely fashion. And also it helps with the burns. Yeah. Not excessively. You don't mean excessively, but liberally. Right? They're not overdoing it. Well, you don't have to use a, a pound of cream, um, but one or two layers would be sufficient. Good. And how about, have you had experience, either of you, in using... Um, lidocaine uh, ointment or lidocaine cream. This is something that I've used for various patients from time to time in my practice quite successfully prior to, I have not tried CBD, you know, based products, but Emily brought that to mind and it's something that we may try here in my center, but have you used any lidocaine based products? Because I found them helpful. I don't prescribe specifically, but the providers that I work directly with, they have, and some patients find benefit and some maybe don't find as much. So person to person. Emily, 40 seconds. Usually the lidocaine is prescribed by either oncologist or a radiation uh, uh, treatment setting. And if the patients are benefiting, they when I see them, they are already done with post lidocaine era and um, or uh, the burn improved so significantly that we do not need to prescribe lidocaine. But I I don't prescribe lidocaine. I didn't find the need for my patients to use that. But a lot of patients, especially here in, in our area, are using the CBD cream. So I'm going to I'm going to kick it back to you, Emily, because we touched on it. And and Kelly had, uh, I thought, very, again, very, very practical, very honest, very candid advice, which is something I'm really uh, appreciating in in Kelly's uh, guest appearance here in the interview is how balanced she is in in many of her opinions. Um, How about, again, with your expertise on the subject? Emily, the idea of this anti-inflammatory diet and the so-called keto diet, et cetera. What are, what are your thoughts and your best recommendations for folks who may be listening? Keto diet is prescribed predominantly, or there is so much on internet now about the keto diet. And it was originally started for lipedema patients, which is different than lymphedema patients. And um Again, if it works for someone, uh, I suggest for the patient to continue, but not for a prolonged period of time. There was one incident where I had a patient who was 
um, ketogenic diet for more, more than one month and she ended up with a kidney problem. So what is important is to have a well-balanced meal and perhaps anti-inflammatory uh, meals. And again, we are talking difference about lymphedema and lipidema. For lipidema patients, I suggest allergic sensitivity testing to see what the patients are allergic to so they can eliminate those aspects in their diet. And ketogenic diet, for a short period of time, I would suggest for someone who wants to try. But what we recommend, and the, the lymphedema, lipidema nutrition guide points out in summary that lymphedema, lipidema patients, they should be careful about sugar intake. A lot of patients are not even aware how much sugar they are taking on daily basis, which correlates with increased toxicity in the lymph system. And uh, number two would be, be careful with gluten intake. And I, I have to think of one patient and she, she told me, oh my gosh, that means I am not going to have my six donuts for breakfast anymore. So no, just have a half of one donut if you have to, but not six. And the last one, dairy. Dairy uh, induces or promotes inflammation. But if you think of the milk from any other, uh, uh, perhaps goat or sheep, uh, it's healthier for the or anti-inflammatory than the inflammatory process through the already processed milk from, from cow. So if you adhere to these three elements, le less sugar, less gluten, and less dairy, the patients will do better. And it, they don't have to reach for the extreme of ketogenic diet. But when we look at the lymphedema patient, we have to look as one, not just one arm, one leg, look at the whole patient. And what we recommend is not only lymphedema treatment, but then do exercises to uh, patient's tolerance, uh, do the compression stocking, do the breathing exercises. And um, there are many different types of breathing exercises on, on media, anything that you can do, enjoy uh, and do that. A lymphedema treatment at home as a self-care is if you would go to from ABC all the way down, it may take hours to treat lymphedema at home, but it's a luxury to spend so much time. But pay attention to the basics. Right. This is great information. So I just want to make sure for myself personally, I have this right, Emily. It's, so it's half a donut, not half a dozen. That's correct. I sometimes get those two confused. So I just wanted to go over that one more time. Now, the one thing that I, <laughs> oh, what are you laughing about? The one thing that I, the one thing that I tell my patients often is, because it's easy to remember, I think, is to, you know, sort of avoid the white poisons, the refined sugar, white sugar, table sugar, or table sugar that might be in anything, white refined flour, and um, of course, table salt, white salt, which I don't think is is helpful. So that's that's a very very easy rule of thumb. But I I don't necessarily know that, as you said, especially long term, a ketogenic diet, which can be considered sort of high fat, moderate protein, lower lower carbohydrate. I think that um, there are there are pluses maybe in a shorter term or intermittent usage of it, but long term. Certainly, it it can carry its own its own hazards, and moderation is is the best uh, medicine in in most things. So, I think it's been a wonderful discussion, Kelly. We're coming near the end of our time. The one hour goes very quickly. Um, we do have a few minutes left. Is there anything else that's of particular importance to you? A passion of yours? Any information you'd like to share? Questions you'd like to pose? The 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 table is yours. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, like, as I said, I think it's just really important as a lymphedema community, and I'm speaking probably more to lymphedema therapists than anything, that we 
go outside the box, meaning outside of the box of the, of the things that you learned in your training. Um, like we talked about a lot during this episode is each part patient is so different and what works for them is very different for another person. And we can't put everyone into one box. That's just not going to work. And hopefully we can continue to find ways to help individualize treatment as much as possible. I'm looking at more health related things, exercise, and not just the basic exercise that they're doing sitting, but can they find something that they enjoy doing, whatever that is that they can be consistent with. And the same goes for all of the treatments. That's really where I hope to see the lymphedema therapy group, but also the community goes in the long run here. Great, great advice. I want to ask one more question of you, and then hopefully we can get uh, Dr. Eicher to to. Uh, weigh in on that also. You know, so many of the things that we see in social media and especially, oh, well, not especially, but including uh, many of the training centers, the schools, et cetera, show these um, photographs of people being being wrapped um, in non-stretch and short stretch wraps and so on and so forth. I I think it's an important question for our, for our listeners and our therapists and non-therapist health health related um, listeners, how many patients, what percentage of patients would you say require long-term wrapping? And how, how practical is it, just as we talked about the practicality and maybe even the safety of being on, let's say, a strict keto diet long-term? What is the practicality um, of people living in in wraps because I I always you know when I when I look at patients in terms of uh, compliance for things that seem so much more reasonable and their non compliance levels always shock me. Um, what are your thoughts on wraps and long term wrapping, et cetera? Yeah, just to clarify, are you speaking towards bandages or are you speaking to, towards Velcro wraps? A bandaging, yes, bandaging. bandaging. But, yeah. but, but you raise, but you raise a great, you raise a great point, and so you can address them both. Thank you for <laughs> clarifying. Sure, yeah, bandaging really. Uh, again, this varies because the spectrum of patient severity is so vast, but anyone who has at least moderate to severe lymphedema, bandaging really is the best way to soften fibrosis or any thickened tissue that we're trying to soften and get the fluid down. We try to go into a garment right away. It's you're looking at more likelihood of having tourniquets and not reducing. And we want to get that fluid out of there. We want to bring it down. So it's, it's, to me, it's crucial for those patients right away. Um, but what I've learned and, and I'm very actually surprised about this is I still see therapists, even in my local area who have patients bandaging long-term. And I, um, I don't know that I have anyone bandaging long-term to be honest, but I do have patients who fluctuate so much that they really benefit from bandaging once a week or one evening a week or once every couple of times a month, or it, again, it varies. We try to individualize it. Um, but I, I personally don't have people bandaging long-term it's used as an initial treatment and it's used as a tune-up per se, if they have a major flare up. Makes sense to me. Uh, Emily, any thoughts there? I totally agree. Um, I think in lymphedema, uh, nothing long-term should be implemented other than compression stockings and manual lymph drainage. And just recently, I had a sweet little old lady, and uh, she expanded. Well, at that time, I applied bandages for one session, she came back and the next day she was much smaller. So she fitted into a compression garment and that was it. So occasionally and on uh, when needed basis, then you can use it. But uh, bandaging and this type of compression should be done initially in the first phase. And once the patient is in maintenance phase, if there is a flare up, then you can use the bandages at short term. One more question before you go. Give me 30 more seconds. Short, in, in this initial bandaging for both of you, non-stretch, short stretch in that initial period? Short. I always do sh short stretch. Short stretch. Short stretch. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> Good. Well, Kelly, I think we covered a lot of great subjects. Emily made it almost to the very end, which was a great, a great surprise and a great treat. Um, 
I think that we shared a lot of great information. You certainly clarified a lot of things for me. It's my pleasure to know you personally. We'd love to have you back on the show in the future and hopefully cooperate in lots of different educational events and and things that we have planned for the future, um, which I think are going to be extremely exciting and, and, and valuable. Um, so thank you again for being with us. And um, any very last last thought or words, and then we'll have our dear friend Paul Reeves take us out. Uh, no, just thank you so much for having me. It was a good discussion. I really enjoyed hearing different opinions. Yeah, before we before we check out, uh, Kelly, I was looking at your website. A lot of great information out there. Why don't you go ahead and put that website out there for our listeners and viewers? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, my website is cancerrehabpt.com. You can find me on YouTube at Cancer Rehab PT and also on Instagram under Cancer Rehab PT. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Chuback has thanked you, so we thank you very much. You've been listening and or watching to LymphCast episode 49 tonight. Remember to visit our website, lymphcastnetwork.com. If you have a question, send it email, hello at lymphcastnetwork.com. We're on YouTube every episode we are on every podcast platform under the sun. Wherever you go, just type in LymphCast. The show will come up. And Dr. Chuback, we want to thank you very much, sir. The uh, the gentleman who had the vision for this show. We're also always up to uh, 49, episode 49. He's also the founder owner of Vita Support MD. They make vein formula 1000, lymphatic formula 1000. Dr. John A. Chuback, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Paul. Always a pleasure. Great program. Thanks again to Kelly Sturm. Um, a terrific resource in the Twin City area. And uh, I encourage everybody in that area to reach out for her if they or a loved one is in need of care, for sure. Absolutely. And of course, we want to thank Dr. Eicher, who had to leave just a few uh, moments before the end. Uh, Dr. Trubach, thank you. Kelly, thank you. And to everybody, again, LymphCast episode 49. We'll see you next time for episode 50.